the Lord our God is mighty. Yes, the Lord our God is omnipotent. The Lord our God, He is one. Therefore, come on, everybody, to the Lord. Salvation and glory. I dare you to sing it. Honor and power. Unto the Lord our God. I don't care what everybody else says. The Lord our God is mighty. Yes, the Lord our God is omnipotent. The Lord our God, He's wonderful. Yes, He is. Put it in your spirit. Let's release it in the atmosphere. Everybody to Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Salvation and glory. Salvation and glory. Honor and power, everybody. Honor and power. Unto the Lord our God. That's it. Make it a song for your heart to sing. For the Lord our God. Yes, the Lord our God. Said the Lord our oh God. He is wonderful. We're the altos. Come on, altos. All praises. Our lesson tonight will be presented by our pastor, Pastor Brown. Hear ye him. With reverence to God and thanks to him for another opportunity for us to come together and to study God's word and this lesson uh, today, united in praise, amen. Uh, pictures or shows us a picture of harmonious unity uh, among all nations. Um, it follows after at the beginning of chapter seven, the sealing of the uh, children of Israel, 12,000 from each tribe, equaling 144,000 that were literally sealed on that day. And I just want to um, say a little bit about John out there on this Isle of Patmos. You know, he was really, it was almost like a solitary issue. Uh, when they put, put you out there, many times you died from loneliness. Um, of course, the absence of some basic uh, things of life, but but it it was you know we are social beings. Which some people say I don't want to be around nobody. That's a sign. That's a signal when people don't want to be around anybody because our natural nature is to be social. And when we are taken out of that, uh, some people can't exist without having somebody to talk to, or you get like Tom Hanks and you you know make an object like Wilson your partner. <laughs> Anybody that is familiar with that with that with that movie know that he literally uh Wilson was his buddy. And Wilson uh, was went, everything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but he you know he really was was a, 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 a soccer ball, but to him it took on um, a real personality. So John was put out there to die in solitary and look at him. He, he's watching, he's, he's communicating with God, the, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he see people, he see hundreds and then he see thousands and then he see a thousand thousand. And then he says he saw 10,000 times 10,000. Then he says, see a number that no man can know. So when God is with you, you're never alone. You're never alone. And he, he can bring visitors if he wants to. Amen. We saw him do it up on the mountain of transfiguration. Amen. Where he brought Moses, where he brought Elijah. Amen. And Moses, the lawgiver and the prophet. And uh, I'm saying, always know that when God is with you, you're never alone. And he said, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. That was one of Job's prayers. When you read in the first uh, eight chapters of Job, Job said, Lord, as I go through this, one thing I ask of you, 
don't leave me. Don't, don't leave me. As long as I know you with me. And, 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 and real believers need to know that when God is with you, that he going to work it out. So three things we're going to talk about in this lesson, uncountable crowd. And I already mentioned a little bit about that. People from every group, every voice, lifting praise. Number two, worshipful circle. Acts of worship, words of acclamation. And finally, the white robe witnesses, robes washed in blood, servants protected from need, tears taken from the faithful. I, 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 I don't know about anybody else, but sound like heaven to me. <laughs> Amen. That if you receive all of those things, um, that this book of Revelation, as you know, is the one book that opens with a promise to everyone that reads the book. A lot of people believe that Revelation only speaks about the future, but the people of that day and time knew that Revelation was not only speaking about the future, it was speaking about their present situation. Some of the things that were going on, the persecutions, the killings, all those things, uh, was a part of that first century church's experience. But beyond their current experience, they could look beyond. And, and, and in reality, I, I feel that in many ways, we no longer take that look. Our four parents used to take that look a lot of times. And, and I think the reason they took that look is because what they had I had them in such a degraded situation that they had to have hope for a better day, hope for a brighter future. And heaven was a part of that hope. Uh, there's also a great belief among many theologians and many uh, readers and writers of the word that there is a code and or some call it a key uh, to understanding some of the mysteries of Revelation and of the book of Daniel. And somewhere along the way, we lost the key. And so we don't glean everything that may be in Revelation or maybe in Daniel, but I believe God lets us glean enough. Amen. Sufficient for me is to know that the wicked going to cease from troubling and the weary going to be at rest and he's going to wipe tears from my eyes and Jesus and his folks going to win. That's, that's sufficient. But some of these keys uh, that unlock things, uh, we, we, we lost them and, and, and uh, the meanings of some of the analogies uh, lost. We, we know they mean certain things, but we're not sure what they mean. So no matter the interpretive perspective of Revelation, if it's just written for the first century, is it a book that's figurative? Is it a book that's symbolic? Is it a book of vivid imagery? Is it a book just to teach spiritual lessons? Irregardless of all of that, we need to know that this book of Revelation is a combination of letter, prophecy, and apostolic, uh, apocalyptic, apocalyptic, let me get the word right, apocalyptic text that does speak to end times, that does speak to what's going to really happen. It's considered partially a letter because of how the book opens with the greetings. It's addressed to specific churches. Revelation is considered a form of prophecy given to John in order that he might declare, <coughs> excuse me, the testimony of Jesus Christ. Revelation is also considered an apocalyptic text during the era in which John recorded his revelation, 
apocalyptic texts were commonplace. It's a stylized type of literature written to unveil God's plan for the world, both in the past and in the future. Second, the book of Revelation is loaded with allusions. The Old Testament uh, uh, used a lot of allusions, uh, and it assumes that, that the reader is familiar with Old Testament resources. Revelation rests on the shoulders of Genesis, Exodus, Daniel, and even Psalms. And its fullest understanding of Revelation recognize its roots in the Old Testament. Third, Revelation emphasized worshiping God. And that's been the emphasis of our last 10 lessons. Praises to God. And today we're dealing with united praise. Each one makes claims about, excuse me, who is worthy to be worshiped in heaven and on earth. Revelation called all the people together to worship God, which sit it on the throne and the lamb. So John's vision after seeing the sealing of the 144,000 of Israel. To, and that, that was a message to those Jews that, that were feeling like their nation, and Paul would have been in that category, that their nation was lost. He's showing them that no, they're gonna be brought in. And in the fullness of time, the Jews would be brought in to the fort to the fold of the fellowship of God through Jesus Christ. So the first thing is an uncountable crowd. Verse nine, after this I beheld and lo a great multitude which no man could number. We are given the impression this great multitude is far bigger than the large but countable number of those from Israel's tribes that John has just witnessed. John's vision is similar to Daniel's vision of a throne room where a crowd of 10,000 times 10,000 stands before the Ancient of Days. That's who Daniel calls the Lord, the Ancient of Days. This is not a mathematical formula but a way of saying this group is uncountable. And a lot of people don't think that, that God has servants. God's got some servants. God's got some, God, God told uh, Elijah, when Elijah was saying, I'm the only one left, God said, no, don't say that. I've got thousands that have not bowed to Baal. God's got somebody, we just need to, let me just say this, I think, one of the things that the church has to begin to emphasize again is going after those who are believers but have strayed from the faith. And to me, that's almost more inreach than outreach. We got to get the people who do believe to put their faith into practice. And when they put their faith in the practice along with those of us who are almost a remnant of the original believing crowd, then we're going to have tremendous impact on turning this world toward an almighty God. This, he said, I saw a great multitude, listen, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues. This, this, this vast crowd is explained in four ways seen right here. The cumulative effect is to show that it is universally representative of all humanity. I'm one who don't believe that only Baptists gonna be saved. I don't believe that. I don't believe just holiness is going to be saved. I believe that there are going to be people 
who are true believers that can be found in any Bible teaching, Bible believing, Christ centered congregation. And while we argue over doctrine, we ought to be going after those who have claimed Christ, but have not lived up to the name that they claim. Hope y'all understand. Does that make sense to anybody? There are thousands out there who accepted Christ, but for whatever reason, could be the church, could be the pastor, could, could be the fact that they can't have their way and follow the true and living God. But you can have your way in some churches, but you can't have your way and follow the true and living God. I don't know what it is, but we need to remind them, especially since we, we see the day approaching. Oh, the day is approaching. Amen. Somebody said, well, I've been hearing that since I was a boy. Well, depending on how old you are, it's much closer now than it was when you first heard it. <laughs> <laughs> The day is approaching. And guess what? If the day is not approaching, your day is approaching. Amen. Well, your ability and opportunity to render service unto God is going to be called to an end. So we need to be about, we ought to, we ought to be reaching out. It includes people of all nations. This is a word for a national group, a political entity. It's also the word sometimes translated Gentiles when referring to any nation that is not of Israel. Kindreds, often translated as tribes, implies people sharing ancestral bloodlines. These transcend national borders. A person's genetic tribe might be Irish, but this does not mean that person lives in Ireland. A people is a group bound together by cultural identity. They would share many cultural markers that might transcend national or ethnic boundaries. They were, had different tongues in this context referred to the languages. Somebody said over 6,500 dialects of distinct languages on earth today. It may not have been a similar number in John's day, but he says he saw them from every language. Languages are not confined to regional or national boundaries. They cross boundaries, can transcend political identities. Verse nine, he said, they stood before the throne and before the lamb, clothed with white robes. The previous description reflects the worldwide penetration of the gospel, regardless of one's heritage or cultural context or origin. Any person can believe and share in God's salvation. The image of wearing white robes means that the person is cleansed from sin. And I'm going to go a little farther and say they've already been judged. Mm. Message of the church in Sardis commended those who had not soiled their garments with sin, but instead had walked with Christ in white, for they are worthy. For the white robes are given as a reward to the martyrs of the church, those who have maintained their faith and witness even unto death. And, and I think at the beginning it talks about symbolism and everything. The white robes were symbolic. Here's something else symbolic. Nine deep palms in their hands. Amen. When they have these palms that reflect a practice of worship that began with the Feast of Tabernacles. But, but there's another thing that palm branches in their hand is symbolized. Victory. Amen. Whenever the Roman army or almost any military body won a victory when they would enter into the city. The people would throw out the palm branches, symbolic of victory. And I believe that this crowd, this 
number that no man can number, standing with white with palm branches in there. They are hers over life. Amen. You know, you can either be a victor or a victim. You can either be victorious or defeated. In eternity, you can't be both. You're going to be one or the other. The people were to take the bowls of goodly trees, branches, and of palm trees and rejoice before the Lord in the Feast of the Tabernacle for seven days. Palm branches. The practice of associating palm branches with an event of victorious joy continued into the time between the Old and the New Testament. In the New Testament, crowds wave palm branches while shouting Hosanna, which means save. During Jesus' triumphal entry, the multitudes in John's vision stood in worship before the Lamb who has indeed saved them. And they had some real reason to praise him. Every voice lifting praise. And verse 10 says, and cried with a loud voice saying, salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. The multitude acknowledge that their hope of salvation is realized in Jesus Christ. This implies God's victory over his enemies and deliverance for his people. It is not fictitious God, a facetious God that is being described only our God. This emphasized the personal nature of God, his relationship with his people fully demonstrated. The means of this deliverance is seen also in the worship of the lamb, salvation through the lamb. Salvation through the our God. Christ's death and resurrection of the Lamb enacts God's salvation. Without Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on Calvary, there would be no salvation. And so they celebrate. They, they celebrate him. Salvation. Now, the truth is, I know we got a lot of holier than thou people who don't do no stuff, but who don't like a good celebration where everybody is happy and everybody is praising and have a reason to rejoice. Whether victory has been won, whether battle is now over, whether tears have been shared for the last time, and the burdens that go with this life have been rolled away, taken away. Ooh, what a time. No wonder Grandma said, what a time, what a time, what a time. When all of God's children get together, what a time. Verse 11 says, and all the angels stood round about the throne. The center focus is on the throne. The center focus is on him that sits on the throne. The, the center focus is on the lamb and about the elders and four beasts, the 24 elders, and fell before the throne on faces and worship God. The inner circle around the throne become the focus again. Their acts of worship involve their whole bodies. They fall on their knees. They fall on their faces, touch the ground, presumably in a full view of a great multitude that worships by joyously waving palms. Ooh, what a sight. Not only are they falling on their knees and falling on their faces and 
worshiping God while the number that no man can number dressed in white are waving the palm branches of praise for the victory and for the salvation that has been given. They also saying amen, which is a word of acclamation, saying could imply more than words merely spoken as the worship, as the words of worship from the inner circle are spoken in unison and have the structure of an ancient hymn, it's possible that these words were meant to be chanted and recited. Those in the inner circle of worshipers voice their worship in powerful words directed to God for eternity. Similar worship is directed to the lamb in the throne room in Revelation 5, 11 through 12. The worship ascribed here is bracketed on both sides with amen. A great translation of a Hebrew word meaning it is true. Somebody said worthy. Somebody said amen. Somebody said great is our God. Somebody said amen. Somebody said praises to God in the highest. And they keep saying the words usage by the worshipers recognize and affirm what follows next. Blessings and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might. And I can hear there's a great chant going up and there's a great celebration going up and there's a great praise going up and there's a whole lot of amen going up. Ah, glory carries the image of being full of light, radiant like celestial bodies. The glory of the Lord sometimes accompanies heavenly manifestation, a characteristic of God's presence in the tabernacle or the temple was a display of his glory called the Shekinah glory, light that's brighter than the noonday sun. The Bible often places wisdom in parallel with knowledge. God has absolute knowledge. He has determined what is right and wrong. God always does the right thing, having never failed, never failing wisdom. When recognizing God's salvation, a response of thanksgiving is appropriate. It is an expression of gratitude to God for his care, for his provision. Honor offers esteem for a person based on the person's character and acts. God is worthy of ultimate honor for his great providential works of salvation and simply because he is God but the providential works of God are wonders, wonders to behold, how he can work a plan. And he's so detailed in the plan that everything that happens along the way was not by accident, but everything was a part of the plan. The word power is used frequently throughout the book of Revelation. It is tied to God's acts of creating and sustaining the universe and God's rule over the entire earth. It is impossible to imagine any greater power. The all-powerful one who created the universe also provides deliverance for his people. Related to power is might. Describes the characteristic of a very strong person as applied to God. This may go be beyond our understanding we can say that God's strength is inexhaustible and without limits. And so they're crying out blessings and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might. What a celebration of a wonderful God. But unto our God, be unto our God forever and ever. This, this hymn ends on an important note that calls for the seven ascriptions 
to be recognized forever and ever. This acknowledges the eternal nature of God. Even our best description of his nature failed to account for the eternality of God. The one without beginning, the one without end, and a God of purpose. Amen. The repetition of amen brings a solemn sense of affirmation to these words of worship. It is true. It is true. What's true? True that he gives blessing. True that he deserves gold. True that he is a God of wisdom and gives wisdom. True that I owe him thanksgiving. True that he deserves honor. True that he deserves power. And true that he has the might. What an awesome God. Ooh, we forget how great our God is. And sometimes when you face great challenges, people say, how are you going to do that? My God is an awesome God. White robe witnesses as I closing discussion, verses 13, 14, but through 17. And one of the elders answered, you know that mean ask, saying unto me, What are these? Uh, what are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence cometh they? So in the midst of this worship vision, this celebration, John is approached with a question from one of the elders. It's not one of the angels. Now, angels do talk to him also, but this is one of the 24 elders. Prophetic literature is filled with examples of questions used as a method of teaching. The elder's question has the effect of asking, do you know? The who, the what, the where, the when, the why, and how of what you see. Who are these folk? And I said, John, thank you for being smart. You were too smart to try to answer. <laughs> hey, man, you must have read Ezekiel. But he, Ezekiel said, can these bones live? Ezekiel said, Lord, thou knowest, because I sure don't know. <laughs> And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. Mm. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Well, whether out of respect or because of uncertainty, John allows the elder to answer his own question. In response, the elder points to two aspects of those in white robes regarding their emergence from great tribulations. We recall that Christians experience suffering in trials of body and faith. And I want you to know we may be facing the same thing. I know people, they, they back up when I start talking like that. But I believe that the, 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 the church that's going to be here when Jesus comes is going to be going through the same thing the first century church went through. The world is going to stop embracing us. In fact, the world is going to resent us. And, you, and, and if you haven't noticed, the resentment has already started. The declaration that the church is an enemy to the freedom of people to make their own choices. That's the beginning of something. It's not the end. That's not the last statement you're going to hear about that. They building up something that's going to make, a church, make the church re realize that they're really is enmity between the church and the world. There's a division. And if we stay true to God, we can't stay friends with the world. I am. Help me, God. Jesus warned his followers that tribulations would be expected. 
He also told them, be of good cheer. To the audience in Revelation, this tribulation could have been related to persecutions at the hands of the Roman Empire. To modern readers, this could also imply the future of the widespread sufferings and persecutions for both ancient and modern audiences. John Vision affirms that following Jesus might result in suffering and even to the point of martyrdom. So the first thing was, who are they? Second, the robes that come through tribulation. Now the robes have not always been white. They are so because they have been washed in the blood of the lamb. What the elder describes is not some sort of an illusion Dipping a dirty garment into a red liquid and pulling it out pure white is not a magic trick or chemical properties. Rather, the drama represents Christ's atonement and our forgiveness from sin based on his sacrificial death. The blood of the Lamb triumphs over sin and Satan. It is fulfillment. <laughs> of John's earlier record and the words of John the Baptist. Behold, the Lamb of God takes away the sins of the world. Th these words provide hope to suffering audiences, servants protected from need. And then not only are these they that come up to great tribulation, wipe their, wash their robe in the blood of the lamb. He goes on to say, therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. Why? Because they came through great tribulation, because they accepted the blessings of Jesus Christ. They washed their robes in the blood of the lamb because they are pure, clothed in white robes, the multiple Multitudes stand before the throne of God. They serve him without pause. The word translated serve can imply an act of worship. Their acts of service are, in essence, acts of worship. Their service worship occurs continually, day and night. Only thing I can say is if you don't like worship, don't go to heaven. It ain't gonna be, it ain't gonna be no two hour worship. It ain't gonna be no 45 minute worship. But, but you can go to worship 24 7. They're gonna be serving him day and night. And I'm saying 24 7. Again, I'm using earth language because look, 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 ain't gonna be no day, no night. So ain't gonna be no seven day weeks. Every day for eternity. Amen. Now, let me say this, and I don't mean no harm, but I do think I need to say it. Do you know there are no birthdays in heaven? And I see people write on there, your heavenly birthday. Ain't no marrying in heaven. Ain't no anniversaries in heaven. <sighs> How you gonna celebrate your two year of being in heaven? Ain't no anniversary, but day and night. This does not imply the existence of our current constructions of time, rather it's an indication of every devoted service. It is an implication that the praise of God will not cease. This vision pictures more than future heavenly bliss. It can also picture our existence now. Acts of worship can be an acknowledgement of a holy God and our submission to him. Sin prevents us from practicing authentic worship in its entirety. We lack the white robed multitude of John's vision of free to worship in holiness, in purity and sincerity and in truth for our sins have been washed in the blood of the lamb However, this worship will not be practiced fully and totally 
until God's final victory and implication of the book of Revelation as a whole. 15b says, and he that sitteth on the throne should dwell among them. Amen. Right now, we don't have the presence of God in one sense. We got his Holy Spirit, which is fit with us. But he said he will be our God. He will dwell among his people. Listen, and because he dwells among his people, verse 16, they shall hunger no more. Neither thirst anymore. Neither sell the sunlight on them nor any heat. So the suffering is over. The trials are over. The absence of uh, necessary nourishment is over because you are in the presence of God. But for the lamb, which is in the midst of the throne, shall feed them and shall lead them unto living fountains of water and God and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Hallelujah. John envisions more than the satiation of physical thirst. The lamb will lead to water springing up into everlasting life. In addition to providing eternal refreshment, the lamb brings eternal peace and eternal comfort, removing sorrow and wiping away all tears from their eyes. There's a song that says, I cried my last tear yesterday and I shared with somebody how I did not believe that song. Because as long as I'm in the flesh, I have the potential of serving, of, or, of, of shedding more tears. But one day, one day, I'm going to be able to say and de declare with confidence, I cried my last tear yesterday. United in praise. What a time. What a time. What a time. We're going to sit down by the banks of the river. What a time. What a time. What a time. And I don't know about anybody else, but I got something to praise him for. I got something to lift my voice to. I got some amens that I need to share with others are talking about what an awesome God he is. And so one day we're, we're going to be united in our praise of our God. Well, God bless you. Thank you for giving this opportunity to share what a wonderful lesson we're looking at in this book of Revelation. And God is awesome. And Brother Superintendent, if there are no questions about this lesson, that's my presentation, United in Praise. Make it glorious, make it glorious.
Uncle Gene.